Good afternoon. My name is Karen Planet. I'm the president of AI Ohio, here to welcome you to today's Practice Innovation Workshop Series program, Architecture in Wonderland. We're all mad here. This is the fifth in a series of six workshops focused on practice innovation that will be presented by AI Ohio this year. I'd first like to thank and recognize our 2021 AI Ohio annual sponsors highlighted on the screen now. Our sponsors are important partners who have helped us bring some innovative and quality programming you've been enjoying this year. I would also like to thank the Practice Innovation Committee Chair, Melinda Scarfello, and committee members, Bruce Sikanik, Bill Willoughby, Kate Brunswick, and especially Emily Little, who led the development of today's program. There's a lot of work that goes into planning these sessions, and they would not be possible without a group of dedicated volunteers. Don't forget to register for the final Practice Innovation Series session at AIOhio.org. We are looking forward to our final session titled Innovative Technologies Reshaping Practice. Uh, registration is also open for the AI Ohio Member Re Recognition Celebration to recognize this year's Honor Award recipients and for their contribution to AI Ohio. And this event will take place in Columbus on the evening of November 4th. This will be our only in-person event for the year. So seating is limited and don't wait to the last minute to register. Uh, before we get started, there's just a few housekeeping items. Our program today is scheduled for one and one half hours, including some time for Q&A at the end of the program. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box. Please make sure your microphone is on mute so that everyone else can hear. Towards the end of the presentation, we will be placing a link in the chat box that you can click on to receive your learning units for today's programs. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Now I'd like to turn the program over to Emily Little to introduce our moderator and the presenters for today's program. Emily. Thank you, Karen. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. Okay, so as Karen said, I'd like, really like to thank all of you for joining us today. For those of you who don't know me, I serve on the AIA Ohio board as a representative of AIA Akron, and I teach at Kent State University. On the screen are our learning objectives for the discussion today. I am beyond excited for this discussion. Um, our panelists, Diana, Cheryl, Kirk, and Evelyn are joining us from different parts of the US and represent a wide range of knowledge, experience, and interests. As with earlier sessions in this practice innovation series, a short white paper will be available for download following today's session, and a video of this presentation will be posted on the AIA Ohio website. I've also been really excited to share a meme with this group, but it was really hard for me to choose just one. So I give you two. And I hope that you find them as relatable as I do. <laughs> um, I'd like to introduce our moderator who is here with us from the UK. Ben Shannon is an architect, author, TEDx speaker, and mental well-being advocate. He's a director at Wellbeing Design Consultancy, ECIST, where he helps clients and design teams to create healthier places. Ben suffered with burnout and anxiety in his mid twenties, which led him to research the relationship between buildings and happiness. This formed the basis of his first book, Happy by Design. Ben now speaks on this subject to businesses and universities around the world. And he's also a Well AP, sitting on the advisory panel for Wells Mind Concept. In 2017, Ben co-founded the Architects Mental Wellbeing Forum, which is focused on improving mental health within the industry. Ben has since worked to help establish forums in Australia and the Netherlands. Thank you for joining us today. And I will now hand the microphone over to Ben. Thank you, Ben. Hi everyone, thank you so much Emily and thank you Karen, um, what a lovely introduction. Um, so I'm really excited about today's session, um, as, as Emily said, I'm based over here in the UK and um, we've been doing a lot of work here to try and promote better mental health 
among architects. Um, I've got to admit, I don't know a huge amount about um, what's been going on on the other side of the Atlantic. So I'm actually just as excited as all of you um, to, to hear from our panelists and to hear what they think some of the issues are um, and also what they think are some of the solutions, how we can all work together to improve as an industry. Um, obviously, I'm dialing in from London, so I really hope we don't have any technical problems. Um, if, if we do and if I get cut off, I'm sure our amazing panelists will just be able to carry on chatting amongst themselves while I get back on. But let's all let's all cross our fingers. Um, so I thought it'd be best if we actually started with our, our panelists introducing themselves um, because they know uh, everything they've done much better than I do. So uh, maybe we should start first with uh, Diana. Thanks, Ben. <clears throat> I'm uh, happy to be joining this panel today. Um, I am the president at SAM Architecture in Boston, Massachusetts. I've been in Boston for about um, see, 12 years, but I moved here from Cleveland. Um, so I was really excited to be able to join um, an AIA, AIA Ohio group. So um, I'm not sure how long we want these introductions to be. I'll try to keep it brief, but I uh, I started my own firm in Boston um, about seven years ago with um, my partner who I'd worked with. We had been at Burt Hill, which used to have the Cleveland office that was then acquired by a large company. And after a few years, we decided uh, in part for mental health reasons <laughs> to start our own firm uh, and not be working for uh, a firm that was managed outside of the country by engineers. Um, and that's been a great experiment for us. We intentionally started seven years ago as a hybrid firm with what we call radical flexibility. And I can probably get into that a little bit more later, but everyone in our firm has always had uh, seven days a week that they can work any hours they wanna work provided people know where they are, they're getting their work done and they're accountable to their team. Um, as you can imagine, we've attracted a lot of people who uh, have been in positions in the industry where their mental health was challenged by the conditions of their work or the amount of work or the balance of personal responsibilities. So our, our um, philosophy from day one is always that we wanted to give everyone a level playing field. So even if you work 32 hours a week or if that's your target, you're gonna have the same opportunities to grow your career as anyone else. Um, and it's, it's actually gone amazingly well and we weathered the pandemic well. So um, we are now 25 people, and we're still uh, partly remote, partly not, depending on what people feel like. So it's been uh, not a huge change, but, but there is some adjustment, of course, following the pandemic. Um, so why is mental health important to me? Um, I've had mental health challenges along the way in my own career. And I think it's really important that people feel like they can talk about that openly. I think that's, that's one of the problems is that it's not something that's discussed um, as often as it should be. So I think this is a great topic. Um, but also um, people in my family have had mental health challenges. So I, I feel very strongly about it. Um, I obviously uh, try to, um, walk the talk in my own company. And um, I think that the pandemic has, in many ways, um, I'm hoping that the changes that we've seen in our industry and around the world have begun to acknowledge that people do have a life outside of work. And fundamentally, your mental health needs to be some balance of your whole life. So work, whatever you're doing outside of work, interests, et cetera. Um, I'm hopeful that that acknowledgement will continue. Um, we've all seen people with their kids and their pets uh, and their backyards at this point. So I think that this has opened the door for more conversation about people's life and health outside of work. Absolutely agree. Thanks, Diana. Um, if we move on to Cheryl uh, next, so Cheryl, if, if you're able to um, introduce yourself and uh, yeah, if you could let us know as well why mental health is important to you, um, that'd be amazing. Thank you. Absolutely. It's really great to be here. Um, I'm Cheryl Duvall and I'm a workplace strategist with Gensler. I lead the consulting and real estate um, practice area for our Southeast region. 
And I joined Gensler just three years ago um, after 30 years of owning and leading a couple of architecture and interior design firms in the Baltimore and Washington region. So I'm hailing you today from Annapolis, Maryland. I'm also a fellow of IIDA and held several local as well as international positions, including international president from 1992 to 93. So that means I've been around for a while. <laughs> so about 15 years ago, I went back to school to get my master's in positive organization development and change from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. And I did that because I was observing how architects and interior designers, of which I was one, we were designing very different workplaces, but we weren't preparing employees and their leaders for how to use these very different workplaces. And that was 15, 20 years ago. That's not even mentioning how different workplaces are today. So after that degree, I, I morphed my services to include more change management um, in addition to workplace strategy and programming. So I, I really uh, love the pre-design part of the, um, of the design process. And so that's where I've been focusing. As for why mental health is important to me, I think like all of us, mental health is just one important component of our whole health ecosystem, you know, our physical health, our spiritual health, our, our well-being. So it's, but to me, it's not the part that we talk about very often. And I think this, having this conversation is really um, wonderful and we need to do more of this. We all know that mental health is very critically important to our own sense of self, our self-worth, but also our relationships at home and at work. And we're a very team-based in architecture and design, a very team-based environment. So what happens and what's going through all of us, um, you know, personally affects the team. And we need to really um, be very dedicated to making sure our mental health is, is good. And I would also say that um, I think during intense change, times of change, like we've had in the last 20 months, it's even more important. And I've survived quite a, a number of challenging uh, changes in my own life prior to the pandemic. So I like to tell people that I've checked all of the boxes. I've been single, married, widowed, and divorced. And all of that while raising two sons. So from a personal side, I know very firsthand how important mental health is to our ability to be resilient and to come out whole on the other side. And so that's why I'm especially interested in engaging in dialogue with all of you. So thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Cheryl. Um, really interesting. I can't wait to get on with this uh, conversation now. Um, let's move on to Kirk then. Um, Kirk, it'd be great to hear a bit more about you and, and why mental health is important to you as well. Thanks. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited to talk as well with this great panel. Um, so I'm Kirk Narberg. I am um, the managing partner and CEO of King & King Architects here in Syracuse, New York. Fun fact about um, my practice is that uh, we're, we're the largest architecture firm in Syracuse with 70 people. Our world headquarters have always been right here in Syracuse, but we're the oldest architecture firm in New York and the third oldest in the nation having been in business since 1868. So we're 153 years old, which is pretty unique. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about today, um, hopefully with some of these discussions as will others about the importance of firm culture uh, and what we truly believe, which is creating a very flexible and open work environment um, where we can all talk openly about things that we're struggling with or areas that we want to work in. So that's going to be a big part today. My other um, areas of interest uh, is that I've been teaching 30 years at Syracuse University uh, for the School of Architecture, and I teach their professional practice classes. And my classes I stress the importance of mental health as well as leadership training um, and you know, developing what I call a whole architect, um, which is something that oftentimes gets missed in the educational process. Because one of the things we all know is that if you've been able to manage um, in some healthy way, the process of, the, um, of educating architects and getting a degree, you've accomplished one major mental health obstacle in your career. Uh, if, if you can nav navigate that successfully, which I know we're also gonna talk about. I've also been uh, integrally involved with the AIA. Um, I was New York State AIA president. 
Um, I moved on to the Strategic Council, which I'm currently serving on at the national level, uh, involved with um, all kinds of topics, one of which is mental health this year for the Strategic Council. So it's near and dear to my heart. But, and you know, really the why I've mentioned a few of those. Um, my practice and my staff, including myself, cannot be successful if we're not in a good place. And we feel like when we're not, that we can figure out a game plan for how to nav navigate that. And we're one big happy family and team, and we can all be successful together. So that's why it's important to me. Great, thank you so much, Kirk. Um, and last but absolutely not least, uh, on to Evelyn. Um, it'd be great to hear from you, please, Evelyn, about uh, about you and wh where you've come from. I know you've got a very uh, interesting backstory and um, and also sort of why mental health is important to you as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ben. And thank you to AIA Ohio um, and, and to all of you for your time today. I founded the original AIA Practice Innovation Lab as a past chair of the Young Architects Forum back in 2017. So it's been really fascinating and interesting to see how regional and local components kind of have adopted that and expanded upon its origins. So I'm, I'm happy to be revisiting it in this capacity. Um, I'm, and I know Kirk and a few others from AIA National and my volunteer leadership service there. I'm currently treasurer of AIA National. Um, I'm also the founder of a Practice of Architecture. It's a consulting group that really helps architecture firms identify, um, identify innovative ways to practice. And I'm all and and a part of that, we have a podcast called Practice Disrupted. So I'm a co-host on a podcast called Practice Disrupted. Uh, in addition to getting my MRC, I also pursued my MBA. Um, but what's more critical to this conversation is that I also doubled with an MPA, which is with an emphasis on organizational development. And that ultimately led to um, roles not dissimilar from where Cheryl was in workplace strategy before I landed in-house at Slack Technologies. So there I'm a senior experience designer. And what I'm ultimately doing is I'm working cross-functionally with not only our real estate team, but our operations team, our biz tech team, Team, our HR team, our learning and development team to understand and build an incredible employee experience for all of our employees from the time that there are candidates to the time that they become alumni. Um, I'm straddling two companies right now because we were just uh, acquired by Salesforce. So I also serve on the global operations team at Salesforce. And it's been interesting to see how um, these two companies are, are looking to, to scale in a hybrid environment. Uh, Slack, pre-pandemic, we were at one-to-one -one desking. I would say about 5% of our workforce was remote, even though our product, you, you would think, would enable that a little bit more. Um, we have converted to being uh, committed to being a digital-first workplace. That doesn't mean we're getting rid of our offices, um, but we do have a new marketing tagline that is out there on all of our products, and, and it's, it's essentially success from anywhere, and we're very much trying to live into that as a company and an organization. Um, I'm here because of you know, all the reasons that I think a lot of other, the other panelists discuss, uh, you know, Cheryl alluded to this being a conversation that really isn't talked about. So thank you again, AI Ohio, for creating that space. Um, I, I think it is cultural deep mental health, but I also think um, it, it has to do with the way we set up our businesses, right? Uh, the cyclical nature of the profession, um, the, the services that we offer don't, that don't allow us necessarily to have as much breathing room or support our employees the way a tech company does. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I actually started Practice Innovation Lab is how do we provide services that kind of bridge um, and actually gives us breathing room <laughs> to not only deliver um, the, pro the projects we want to deliver, but also kind of maintain, you know, a a happier uh, life at the end of it. So I think that's it. Amazing, thank you so much. And again, yes, thank you very much to AIA Ohio for putting together 
um, such an amazing panel. I, I kind of want to ask all of you how you all manage to do everything you do and look after you and maintain your own mental health at the same time. But I'm sure we'll probably come on to, to discuss some of that a little bit later on in the session. Um, so I wanted to start with um, potentially quite a provocative question. It's, it's not meant to upset anybody, so I hope it doesn't. But um, I've certainly witnessed here in the UK and in Europe, um, there's a real range in terms of how much practices care about mental health. And we see some fantastic practices who are really passionate about it and really, really embrace mental health and try to have this open dialogue about it. But then we see some other practices and you, you kind of think they, they just really don't seem to care at all. So I don't know which of you is best placed to jump in and answer this, but whoever feels they would like to, please do. Um, but why do you think we should care about mental health in architecture? Why is it so important? I can jump in. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, we are in a creative business and when your mental health is not as strong as it could be, I believe it really impacts your ability to work uh, as a designer, as a thinker, um, you know, as someone who's engaging other people, you know, you think about the client interface, you need to be able to give that, give that energy to them that they're looking for and really um, give your whole self to thinking about their design problems. So I think um, there's the piece that, you know, this is a service industry and we need to um, make sure that we're giving people the best service we can. Um, but also I think that uh, the, the, the profession as we know is challenging in so many ways uh, every day. And there are times when you really have to have uh, a strong presence of mind in order to address the things that come up every day. Um, it might be the team that you're working with, it might be consultants, it might be on the job site, um, but you need to be, again, able to address problems and challenges um, and not get to beat down by some of the aspects of being an architect. Completely agree. Um, does anybody else uh, have any thoughts on that question? Yeah, I mean, mine I don't think is nearly as deep as Diana, although I agree with her. Um, I mean, we're, we're simply, we're licensed to protect the health, safety, and welfare of um, the individuals that occupy our buildings. I would say that also means that we should be protecting the health, safety, and welfare um, of our employees. And that includes kind of the whole health, mental health, um, and well being of our employees. So that's my simple answer. I'm just going to add one more thing to what Evelyn just said. Um, we, and I, I talk about this in class a lot with students, architects are very good thinkers, right? And we're strategic planners. Um, but one of our greatest faults is we get so caught up in the details of helping others that we forget to help ourselves. And that's kind of the nature of business. And um, which is why it's really great to be having this discussion because we all know that when things are running hundred miles an hour, we get so caught up in that, meeting deadlines, making sure that we're you know, meeting our commitments that we forget about just taking a step back and breathe every now and then and think, you know, how is this affecting me? Am I in a good place? You know, are my team members in a good place? And, and sometimes it's as simple as just touching base and just making sure that people are okay and that they have at least somebody looking out for them. And so, you know, I know we're going to get into some of the strategies and stuff, but I think firms have uh, evolved and continue to evolve with a greater emphasis on that kind of support network of having not only outside resources, but also internal resources, potentially through the HR department or other places to help with that so that there's multiple avenues that, that people at least can talk um, at the very least. And I think that's even tougher because we've been working from home so much, right? So you can't just see that somebody is struggling. We all of a sudden, you know, we just, we pick it up or we maybe a meeting ends early and we're able to chime in and just say, hey, stay on for a minute. Um, so I think, I think what you're saying, Kurt, is spot on. It's just been much more challenging when 
we're working in a hybrid situation or we're still mostly working from home. Um, and I think that's gonna continue, right? The hybrid is here to stay. Um, it's just a matter of how, you know, how hybrid it might be and more companies maybe um, less than others, but that intentional taking care of each other and noticing that somebody might need to talk um, is, is something that's just more challenging when we're, we're meeting like this. Yeah, that's so interesting, Cheryl. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to steer the conversation, sort of just not go too much into the coronavirus thing, because I think we're all fed up of it at this point. But um, as you say, it's, it's impossible to separate the two, really. Um, it's, it's so entwined with, with office culture and all these things that we're, we've been talking about already. Um, yeah, Kirk, I, I thought your point as well about making sure we look after ourselves is, is really relevant. Um, the analogy I've heard is the oxygen mask, you know, put your own oxygen mask on so that you can help others. And I think that that's completely true as well. Um, you know, if the people at the top aren't kind of looking after themselves, then it, it can absolutely trickle down. So um, that's a really interesting point. Um, one of the things that um, one of the reasons that I, I set the group up in the UK, the Architects Mental Wellbeing Forum, was because we were seeing such uh, sort of systematic, almost endemic problems with mental health throughout the industry here in the UK. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to hear sort of you guys' thoughts and experiences. And again, simply because I don't know the stats as well as I'm sure you do, um, but is, do, are you facing similar problems in, in the US? Um, is, is there kind of, um, does there seem to be a problem with mental health across the industry? Is, is this something you're seeing? I don't mind Cheryl or Diana, please, one of you okay. go ahead. Uh, well, I'll, I'll mention, I actually worked in Europe for a couple of years. Um, and it felt very, I mean, I was working outside of Venice in a very, um, I guess a traditional firm. I don't really know how to describe it. They weren't, uh, you know, a boutique firm or anything, but um, it was, it was a while ago. But I had come, I had been working in New York City for four years before I moved to Europe. And I had started out in a really large, well-known high-end design firm where I was working, you know, until four in the morning on the weekends and crazy things like that. So, and actually then I ended up at Gensler where I felt like there was more balance. Um, but um, when I was working in Europe at the time and Southern Europe is its own animal compared to the UK. Uh, I was amazed at how everyone really did leave the office for lunch, went home, spent an hour and a half at least before they came back. And they thought I was so weird for working at my desk with my lunch. Like they, they couldn't understand that. And I couldn't understand why they were all leaving for so long. Um, and then they all left at the same time at the end of the day. And so for me, that was kind of radical at that point. Um, I'm not sure that the culture has stayed like that uh, in Italy or elsewhere in Europe. But coming back to the United States, it did help me think a little bit more about like what do I want to happen in a day? Um, so, I, but I do, to, to answer your broader question, absolutely we see these issues in this profession in the United States. And I think, um, you know, I've certainly worked in positions where I felt like my time was abused, that, you know, my, um, design contributions were not valued or even heard. Um, you know, I think there's also this intense hierarchy that's existed in traditional firms forever, right? Like the whole atelier model, and we'll probably talk more about schools too, but it, it, it begins the minute you walk out the door. And um, I think, you know, there's a real variety of firms that I interact with in Boston. I'm really active in the Boston Society for Architecture. I talked to a lot of people about practice issues and there are firms that still have that culture and there are others that are really working to not have that culture. But I still don't think mental health is at the forefront of that discussion of, of those firms that are trying to advance a more comfortable and, you know, a more comfortable environment and a better balance. So what is it? The for, sorry, what is at the forefront of that, Diana? Well, if they're not I, doing know, I know you don't want to health. bring the pandemic in too much, but that's mm -hmm. that's like change, that's mixing up the whole discussion, I would say. So um, at the forefront, I think, is um, is equity, which is definitely t 
tied to mental health, but people aren't necessarily making that association. I think, you know, equity in our profession is, is um, such a critical issue. It's something that we think about a lot at my firm. And um, I know a lot of people are thinking about it, but, uh, uh, you know, and I use that word recognizing it also has um, a very broad definition in our work. It's, are we designing equitable spaces? Do we feel like we have an equitable approach to design? Do we have, do people feel like they have equitable opportunity? Um, so I think that's, I think that's an important thing very much, but it is at the forefront, I would say. Okay, thank you. And sorry, Kirk, we cut you off there. You were about to jump in. No, I was just gonna, I was just gonna add a couple of things. I'm, I'm gonna tell you from my perspective, what I believe is one of the best silver linings within the pandemic. Uh, and everything that we've done, which is that the, the kind of hybrid model, um, and, and I'll use my firm as an example, we've been trying to push a more flexible work environment for years. And honestly, architects are some of the hardest people to steer in a different direction because you know, as much as people want to believe that they want to have the flexibility to do other things, and not work a traditional day and work in the office every day. It's amazing how difficult it's been to get people to think a bit differently about that. And so for us, having people on purpose not come into the office has been a bit of a blessing in terms of getting people to rethink what a day looks like and that it's okay to do some things differently and that it doesn't necessarily have to be an eight to five day. It could be an eight to 11 day and you're in the office and then you go out to lunch or maybe you go work out, take a run or whatever else. And then you pick up sometime in the afternoon and do a few things, maybe you check emails, but it could be from home. It could be like Evelyn said, it could be from anywhere that you can be successful. And, and in some ways, you know, the pandemic has forced people to kind of reevaluate what's important in their lives and, and how to make that work for them because it's not the same for everybody. Um, and in doing so, uh, it's created some challenges like Cheryl talked about with being able to identify, um, you know, some of that mental health related um, challenges with people being so isolated. But it's also kind of opened up some eyes um, as to how we can rethink how this thing operates moving forward um, and provide that flexibility and not necessarily force people to do the same thing every day all the time because it's definitely situational yeah i think that's one of the really interesting outcomes of this pandemic and uh ties back into what diana was saying about the fact that you know we're thinking differently about maybe the most productive you know that the way to have staff be most productive isn't to have them do 80 hour weeks every week and actually that's not going to work over um a long period of time i i know for example um in denmark and a lot of scandinavian countries um, if, if you end up working late, they, they don't see it as you being hardworking or being dedicated. They just see it that you're quite slow and actually quite bad at your job. So um, there's, there's more than one way to look at these things, um, which I, I think, again, is, is really interesting. Um, Cheryl, I know that you've um, written, written a blog piece about sort of some of the call, some of the reasons for some of these mental health issues we're seeing in the industry, things like the cyclical nature of architecture. So I wondered if maybe you could expand on that a little for us. Absolutely. Um, so I have been around long enough that I've weathered six recessions, um, including uh, the, the, the one that I guess we were in last year that feels like it's we've been coming out of it. Um, but in all of those recessions, it's been very interesting that to watch that our industry gets hit the first. It's like the design and construction industry, it's like everything stops. And it's very rare for that not to happen. Now, of course, some sectors are more in, protected them from others. I primarily focused in the workplace sector. So I've been designing offices and even our change management programs, which I've been leading a lot of lately. Um, last summer, they just stopped, even though they were redesigning headquarters and we were designing change programs for them. They stopped because everything was focused on the pandemic. And then it's now it's focused on the return to office. And when's that happening? So, so it, we, we see the cyclical nature of just the amount of impact that any of these recessions and downturns in the economy have. And certain sectors are more you know, um, affected than others. I remember in 2007, the Great Recession, 
I was speaking at uh, for AIA in Atlanta and 60% of the architecture industry in Atlanta had lost their job, 60% of the architects when I spoke to them. And they asked me to speak to them about hope. And so, so I, I designed a presentation around leaning into change and the things that we can do during that time. And one of those things is to build alliances with each other. You know, So all of a sudden, maybe people who were your competitors or maybe you didn't even see, see them as alliances, you could form alliances with um, and do things together because it, it was better to do it together than, than separately. So I think looking for ways that we can open the dialogue with each other during these, these recessionary times um, or just challenging times, you know, making sure that you're you're looking at all of the possibilities. I think to Diana's point earlier about we're a creative industry, we're creative minds. So what can we do to think creatively about something that we might be doing differently this time around? And I think that you know, being open to these conversations, talking about mental health, um, re realizing that that these downturns cause stress and anxiety at levels that are um, unheard of. When you, when you look at the impact that um, just being laid off from, from job and what that does, there's, if um, later any of you can Google Holmes and Ray, it's H-O-L-M-E-S and Ray, R-A-H-E. They did a stress scale of a hundred points. Um, and you look at any of your life events within a year and see where that is, and it talks about your stress level. And then if you need to seek medical help in order to help you through those stress times. And I think when you look at a recessionary year and you look at the stress levels, you can use that, their, um, their scale to help um, identify. Um, try not to put too much into a year. If you already know you've lost your job, try not to also move your house, you know, those kind of things that you try not to do too many stressful events within a certain period of time. Yeah, and I think that's that's a really interesting point, the fact that um, obviously we, we have very little control over the, the, the broader markets, but it's also really hard to, there's only so much we can do in a sense, and people will naturally have things go on in their private life. Um, and, you know, you've mentioned divorces and moving house or whatever it might be, the loss of a loved one. All of these things do also play a role um, within people's mental health. But again, it's that idea that, you know, the, the job can almost be that kind of one stable thing for people when, when other things are going wrong. And so um, naturally, when, when there's sort of uncertainty around, around your job too, um, yeah, it can be such a major factor. Um, Evelyn, I wondered if you kind of had anything to add on sort of what your thoughts on kind of the, these, these kind of causes or the, the root behind some of these issues that we do see in, in mental health in the industry. Right. No, I mean, I, you know, I agree with Cheryl. I often start my talks with um, we are we are three recessions away from being extinct. Right. Like um, every time we have a recession, we lose people out of the architecture field and we are um, subject to the most cyclical economic cycle, historically cyclical and economic cycle. We will always have clients that are building and you'll always have clients that aren't building. Um, Prior to going down just the pure workplace strategy path, I actually um, led a strategy group within an architecture firm. And the reason why that strategy group was uh, started was to really get ahead, do the strategy at the tail ends of where we traditionally practice, essentially expanding the the opportunity for architects to continue to remain relevant with their clients, even when their clients aren't building. Um, and, and that's where I think, you know, there, there's greater opportunity for us to develop those relationships, uh, not with our clients or even with potential clients, to really um, kind of stem the ebb and flows that recessions um, bring to architecture firms. And, you know, a lot of people, when they think strategy groups, they think very large firms. So this is actually um, a firm that at, during the time I was there, we were as small as 12 when times were tight, and we were as large as 40. Um, and, you know, the, the interesting thing about the strategy group is we were able to charge fees that were more in line with Deloitte and McKenzie and Bain, not necessarily as expensive as the consulting group. Those consulting groups, um, but, um, and, and we were able to manage our time a little bit better. So it, it was, it was, it created a, a, a better, 
um, kind of lifestyle for me and, and where I was at. And, and I was ha- pregnant with my first child at the time and, and trying to learn what becoming a, a mother was. Um, so I, you know, I think um, they're just, they're just things that are inherent to our, to our, to the way we do business. And I think, um, including mental health that stems back to that practice model. Um, and, you know, again, it's like, how do we give our practice, how do we give our businesses um, the, the breathing room to serve our people the way we want to serve um, to serve them? You know, I, I, I know a lot of social media groups that talk about like even, you know, new moms or people that are interested in becoming parents wanting extended maternity leave. And the way that we've set up our business models is really hard to keep on somebody as over overhead, right, when they're not contributing to billable hours. So, so is there other ways that we, other services that we can provide to, to help us um, give us that breathing room? Because there's definitely firms out there and from leaders that really want to do the right thing, but they're, you know, sometimes they're just held back by the fact that they don't have the, the financial ability to support their employees that they, the way that they ultimately want to support their employees. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, really relevant. Um, it's something we've seen uh, in, in the UK with, with our mental wellbeing forum and in the forum that I've been working with in Australia too. So interesting, we're on completely different sides of the planet and yet we're seeing the same issues with architects undercutting one another and sort of co- competing for work. And um, again, it was interesting what Cheryl was saying, that, you know, we sometimes we need to work together to help get through this as an in, get through these times as an industry rather than constantly trying to chip away at each other. Um, I wondered if anybody else had any thoughts in terms of to what extent kind of fees, whether that's charging proper fees or, you know, undercutting can be connected to this and, and the problems that that can cause really. I think in the traditional firm model, um, that really depends on the level of transparency because um, I feel like a lot of people that work in this industry have no idea what their firm charges for their time, for a project, what an overhead rate is, any of that. And so I think that uh, it still has an impact on their mental health though, because those project managers and principals are the ones that are saying, no, you can't have more staff and no, you need to get this done quickly. And and people don't always understand why. And so like financial transparency is something we're working on at our office. We had like um, an all office gathering in person outside recently. And our COO actually used Duplo's blocks that her kids had, where she had 10 of them and a certain color were like direct labor and a certain color were, you know, expenses. And then anyway, to to just explain to staff, like, this is one of your hours and this is how it works. And that was great. People, you know, people really have started to understand that. But I think, you know, certainly if you're in the senior project manager or senior leadership role, absolutely, these are stressful. Like, as you said, competing for them managing them, having discussions about getting more of them when the scope changes, that's that's a huge mental battle, at least I've found that to be. It's taken me a long time to be able to address those issues comfortably. I would say that, um, and Diana said it pretty well there, um, transparency is huge. I can tell you, having been an employee myself, what doesn't work is being forced to do projects given and given a fee and then being um have your performance based on something that you weren't part of so i can tell you one of the things that because of those experiences that i've done very differently with my own firm practice is that we are very transparent about all financial information and when we pursue projects the actual act of even pursuing a project includes the collective team or proposed collective team as part of that go, no, go decision-making process. And then they are the ones that are producing the fee structures based on the effort that's required and that they commit to based on their own experiences because they have to own it. And you know, you know, if you can have a more collaborative process by which you're doing all those things, that takes one of, one of the biggest obstacles out of the mix in terms of the ownership and being basically told what to do versus being part of what it is that you want to do. Yeah, I think all, all very relevant and, and interesting. Sorry, Cheryl, did you want to say something? I was just going to say that, you know, Gensler is, you know, I've just joined 
less than three years ago. Um, and I am so amazed and pleased at how transparent we are. Um, we're an ESOP, so we're employee owned and everything you can look up anything and, and see it. And we make sure, and we also have a start smart project. As soon as we start a project, you know, making sure everybody on the team is aware and it goes a long way. And that, that transparency that Kurt's talking about is incredibly important. And, um, making sure that your team members um, are aware. And one thing I was going to add too is I think to what we were talking about earlier that when when the pressures of um, delivering the services, I've been watching some of the comments in the chat um, come about. What what we've often found too works best is when the teams themselves have each other's back. And if you're really working as a team. And you know someone's burning the midnight out, and you're trying very hard. It's who else can help this person? You know, it's it might be, need to be somebody outside the team because the team might be too crazed, right? And and that's also what I've enjoyed about the about Gensler and the the you know the, just the enormous size of us, but the the ability of us to come in and help with each other. And I think that can still happen though in a small team, you know. And so that that commitment to each other that. Um, we're there for each other, and that's going to help us manage our stress and our and lower our anxiety and help each other can help each other. And so we're such a team-based practice that to really emphasize the importance of teams, you know, build your teams, make your relationship strong, and manage things together as a team so you don't feel so isolated and it's, that it's all on you. Absolutely. And I think it goes back to, uh, I can't remember who made the comment earlier, but the idea that, you know, it's it's just really important to actually have that that transparency, that openness, being able to actually talk about mental health and for someone to be able to put their hand up and say, actually, I'm feeling overworked or I'm feeling overwhelmed. Um, I'm, you know, I'm struggling with my workload. That shouldn't be seen as a sign of weakness. It should actually be seen as a sign of strength. And unfortunately, we work in an industry that has been very male dominated for a very long time and therefore it still has these kind of remnants of quite a macho culture in it i believe um my, just my own personal view but um you know i think we are now starting to see a shift certainly here in the uk and i hope the same over there to, to a situation where people are more prepared to put their hand up and and be more transparent when things are difficult um and in terms of sort of changing cultures and things too uh, one thing i wanted to ask about is um kind of how how it's what the relationship is with architectural education over there i know kirk you you mentioned it but certainly again something we see is is kind of unhealthy habits coming up immediately from the from education students learning that it's okay to do all-nighters and things like that is that something you're seeing over there too oh my gosh so um you know i started this adventure about 30 years ago with um, my exploration of leadership and what makes architects ticks because I just wanted to know for my own well-being. But, you know, the educational process is like more entrenched in archaic ways than, um, you know, the, even the profession is. And so we foster, and I'm going to say we loosely, but we foster, unfortunately, with the educational process, some of these really bad habits uh, and bad perspectives um, that that contribute to people's well-being because it's in many ways it's a very negative environment because as we all know with reviews um, you know the, the most reviews are are related to pointing out what's wrong versus what's right and and propping people up from their efforts and so people get so amazingly beaten down through that process and like it's like a badge of honor if you've made it through because we all have um, but it hasn't changed that much and I it's funny because um, I, I was teaching yesterday afternoon and I brought that up um, because I was talking about the fact that we were going to have this panel today and how important it is but there are ways to to kind of adjust that um, and really easy ways to do that. If you can just kind of refocus the attention in a more positive way with the learning experience. And that, as you pointed out, Ben, you know, this whole philosophy of basically working in studio until four o'clock in the morning is, you know, that, that means it's kind of like what you said about what other countries think of that, right? In architecture school, you know, if you're not in studio at four o'clock in the morning, then you obviously aren't doing anything. Right, because I I lived that as a graduate student. Right, I worked from home because uh, I was married at the time, and I can't tell you how many people said, "Well, 
you know, Kirk, are you even going to get your work done? Because you weren't, you weren't with us last night. And I was like, well, I, I work in a different way. You know, I get up in the morning at seven, I get all my work done. And by the time I get after dinner time, you know, I'm going to get rest and, and take care of my own well-being. you know, and staying up till four o'clock in the morning is not good for anybody for any length of time. But, you know, those are the types of habits that get fostered, unfortunately, still in school, um, which is like, you know, and everybody's treated in a way uh, in many cases where that's what they should expect when they get out. Right. And so the competition continues. The, the need to spend more time than anybody else is spending is at the forefront of the objective versus, you know, trying to to balance things. Um, with with all the other things that are important in life that is outside of architecture. Yeah, I completely empathize with a lot of that. And it's, it's really interesting to read uh, a lot of the stories that are coming in. It's kind of uh, just tales of, of woe and misery from architecture school, really. And it, it took me to fifth year, Kirk, to realize, actually, maybe I don't function at my best when I've had three hours of sleep. But it just seems crazy that it, it took me that long. Um, I don't know if anyone else had any thoughts about um, about education or uh, um, whether I, whether I should move along because I, I think we've we've heard pretty pretty good summary from Kirk there. Um, I suppose the next thing I'm interested in is um, really kind of to, to get really into the nitty gritty with this is how good do you think we currently are at addressing some of these issues? Just you know the issues of mental health and, and this this culture within an industry and. I suppose what I'm trying to get at is what do we need to change on an industry level? What, what can we do as an architectural industry? And I appreciate that's a, that's a big question to answer, but just would be keen to hear people's thoughts really. I'd like to start by saying, I think, and again, I just recently joined Gensler, but um, when I owned my own architecture and interior design firms, the basic benefits were, you know, health insurance and maybe long-term, you know, disability insurance and other things. And I've seen more and more companies go to the assistance programs, employee assistance programs. Um, so I don't know, Ben, if you have that over there, but we, we have it here. Um, and I think that's helpful, you know, and, and the constant, we, we just finished our well-being week on two weeks ago, I guess. And there were seminars and webinars about financial health in addition to your physical health and your mental health and other things. And a reminder to people, you know, you have these benefits, it's up to you to use them or not if you need them. But I think that that, I think expanding the benefits that we offer and having the conversation that it's not taboo to talk about this. Um, I would also say that encouraging different kinds of practices within, um, you might use practice in a different way, different kinds of um, activities within our companies. Uh, for instance, um, last night we had a fireside chat in our Southeast region consulting group. So every third Monday at the end of the day, we're doing a fireside chat and we just invite different people to come and tell a little bit of their story. So last night we had three people, they could each talk for up to 15 minutes about themselves and then five minutes Q and A. And embedded in all of those, when you tell your life story, like when I did mine a few months ago and talked about being single, married, widowed and divorced, it opens up a lot of you know, questions. And, it, and I was able to talk about my own um, path and, and what I did to stay healthy and where I needed help and how I asked for help. So if you embed the conversation about mental health within the broader life picture, so it's not such a taboo. And I think fireside chats and opening people, like just letting them tell the stories and letting people ask questions enables us to have the mental health conversation in a totally different way. So we actually, in our office, um, have definitely gone that direction because I always say that uh, HR executives would be nervous if they knew what we all talked about in our office because, well, first of all, we're, we're 25 people, we have 23 women. So there's a lot, lots of talking, <laughs> but, um, you know, we always have someone who's expecting, and I'm not quite sure how that keeps happening, but we have, so there are lots of questions about, you know, managing kids and families. Um, but we really, we've done, uh, we all really have worked to support one another. So because we have this extreme level of flexibility, everyone recognizes that so-and-so is not going to be here because she wants to go to so-and-so's soccer game. 
It's up to that person to decide if soccer or the client meeting is more important. We encourage them to come to the client meeting, but if they don't, people on their team are willing to step in. And so we're all very much involved in each other's lives in order to support each other. And our employees have told us, it's never anything we even thought about as, as a consequence of that, is that there's, there's no competition in our office amongst the staff, which is unusual in an architecture firm. And I hadn't really thought about that, but that's our perception as well. Um, so, so I think the level of comfort people have with understanding uh, you know, people's personal lives could stand to increase. Um, so I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's something that, you know, it's, our, it's easier to sort of develop in a smaller firm like I'm in, but it's, it's still worth having discussions like you're having, Cheryl, where like you get a subset of people. And because we've always, um, we've always had happy hour on Mondays at our office, because that was the day when everyone would come in and we would all meet together. We still have a group, smaller group that now still comes in on Mondays and we still have happy hour. And we talk about everything in the world at that happy hour. And it's really therapeutic for everyone. Um, so I don't know, I think, I think it's a challenge though in, in bigger circles. I think we talked about you know, a lot about the need for the business model to change, and that's very big picture, but there's a lot of things, you know, Cheryl and Diana both mentioned things that like a firm can do tomorrow. So one thing is, you know, instead of sick days, like call them wellness days. And I feel like that gives people permission to take mental health days as a sick day, right? Um, that is a change that any firm can make tomorrow in terms of kind of reframing what being sick is and what like not showing up in the office on, on days that you need a break is. Uh, one of our managers, so we share kind of best practices of, of how, we're meant, how we're managing through hybrid practice and we use those to incorporate into our hybrid practice playbooks. But you know, one of our managers, um, and this is picked up, started off all of her meeting with meetings with like, this is what it's like to me, mean to to be me today, you know, and the story might be like, I was late getting my kids to school. We had just heard that um, somebody had come, like somebody, one of the students came down with COVID, but it, it just like, it opened the conversation of like, this is what it means to be me today. Um, if you, if you need to share that out, please do. And then like, that was kind of the icebreaker before she would jump in into the meeting. So it, it kind of sets everyone's reference in terms of where are these people coming from today? And it might be a hard day for them to manage, which means that they're, they might be a little bit more quiet and in the background. It might be an amazing day, you know, and they're just like ready to stand, stand up and contribute. One of the biggest differences that I've seen in all the architecture firms that I work in and just having switched over to tech is, is just kind of the welcome that you get from day one in tech firms. I mean, we, we kid about like the bathroom details that we kind of lay on, like, you know, the, the new grads and, and new, um, the younger, the, the new people starting, the new employees to our firms. Um, you know, one of, one of the most, um, and that one of the best things that happened my first day at Slack is they literally sat us down and they told us you are here because you are intelligent. We know that you're fully capable of doing the job that we hired you to do. Um, we want you to contribute day one. So that means if there's something about this orientation even that we can make better, please let us know. And I think that's like a very, like that kind of welcoming environment that you can contribute from day one. It doesn't matter what level of experience you have is kind of very different than the hierarchical nature of our, our firms. So so that's that's a big thing. And then for me, it's, it's really about um, letting people know that it's okay to fail, right? That, that no one's perfect. Um, I, I know architects like have like a lower risk tolerance. We build a lot of prototypes as our final building, but you know, there's a lot of different pieces that go into the building. There's a lot of opportunities for failure to happen. Um, it's, it is much easier in tech to kind of fail often and fail fast, but just a, allowing people to, you don't grow without that failure. So acknowledging that it's going to be happening, going to happen. And, and I think it's the way, the, emo the way that the most, 
like the emotionally intelligent response to those failures will go very far in terms of supporting the mental health and well-being of your employees. I, uh, Evelyn, you said some things which are really key about the feedback loop, and it, yeah, you're spot on when you say, um, you know, there's some easy things that firms can do right now, and one of the easiest things that firms could do right now is ask your employees what's important to them because people have different value statements. And so uh, I've seen it fall into um, many firm owners or leadership fall in the trap of assuming what they think is important and then doing things without really asking if that's a really important item. And then, and then what they believe is gonna be a very successful thing becomes a problem because they didn't do the simple first part, which is ask, just ask for that feedback to find out what, what really is important. And you're most likely gonna find that different things are important to different people. So how do you create that flexibility in that environment? And then one other thing I just wanted to add that you mentioned about, about sick days. So one thing that we did that's very not traditional in our profession is we did away with vacation and sick days. We don't track them. Unfortunately, labor laws require us to track them for hourly employees, but for all of our salaried staff, they have they can take whatever time they want for whatever reason, whenever, as long as they perform their positions. And so it's a performance-based environment. So we don't keep track. If somebody's taking eight weeks of time off, five days, whatever, you know, they're welcome to do whatever they need to do for their own well-being. Uh, and actually, we do kind of keep track to make sure people are actually doing some of that because that is important because uh, that is another problem in our industry. Um, but um, yeah, just take it one step further and just do away with all of that stuff if you can and just let people manage their lives. Kirk, we have unlimited vacation. I mean, it's the same concept. And, and there is a certain freedom that comes with that. And we tell people, if you only got to 38 hours this week and you want to put in PTO, that's fine for those right. other two yeah. hours if you're targeting 40. But it really, like in terms of mental health, um, it allows you to deal with the other responsibilities in your life so much more easily. You don't have to officially take time off to take you to the doctor or your parent to the doctor or to go close on your house or to take the ARE. It's just, it's it's a non-event. And we we really don't track it either. We have uh, you know, people that are from Europe and all over the globe, Middle East, who've gone and worked abroad for, you know, like they'll go for three weeks and they'll work for two weeks and then they'll take time off or not, or they do kind of, uh, you know, half and half while they're on vacation. So I think that's, you're absolutely right. It's, it's a huge um, boost to everyone. Yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased we've kind of, we've hit on this subject too, because it's something I'm fascinated by this, this idea that, um, you know, we, we really everything we do in the industry is driven by completing tasks and yet we don't employ people based on a you know we're employing you to complete tasks it's we're employing you to sit at your desk for this many hours a week and actually by moving to that sort of output focus method rather than the, the time focus method it makes a lot more sense as you say and um, as you're all saying kind of so many benefits of it so it's great to hear um, people are, are embracing that and uh, ultimately I think it, it comes down to trust doesn't it it's about a culture of trust um, a lot of these things we've discussed today really seem to come down to office culture and whether that's about more openness, more transparency, more trust. Um, I, I suppose um, we, we've talked a fair bit about what practices can do now and how we can develop that culture. But I finally kind of wanted to just have a think about what your recommendations would be. As I said at the start, you're, you're all doing um, amazing things. You're all clearly very busy people that um, have, either work very, very hard now or at some point in your life have gone through spells of working incredibly hard. Um, what can architects do to better look after their own mental health? What can people kind of take away from today as some, some things that they can do with their, with their own life to, to look after themselves that bit better? Uh, I mean, I'll just jump right in. I'll, I'll say that, um, you know, for, for me and my own personal journey, one of the most eye-opening experiences to have a kind of an outside executive coach, um, and it doesn't have to be necessarily the name executive coach, but someone that you can talk to that 
most likely should be outside of the realm of architecture because you can have sort of a more open and honest discussion, but somebody who understands kind of the challenges of, of employment or ownership or, you know, just kind of day-to-day -day activities. Um, and I, I hesitate to say psychologists or psychiatrists, but, you know, somebody that's equipped and, and has the experience and expertise to, to just be a sounding board and, and to help you explore and to be open about some of these things. Cause it's one of the biggest obstacles for most people is to just, is, is to have somebody to talk to and to be open about it. Um, and that's not necessarily an easy thing to do for many. Um, I, I totally support what you said, Kurt. Um, I have used both therapists as well as personal coach many times. In fact, making my decision to join Gensler, I hired a personal coach for the third time. The first time I hired him, it was because my husband and I wanted to quit our jobs for seven months and go sailing. So we took a sail battle while we were still young enough to do it. And we did. Awesome. Because <laughs> I learned early in life that life is too short. So so anyway, so we did that and I hired the same coach to help me through some other stuff and then hired him again to help me make the decision that when I when Gensler made me an offer. Um, one thing that I was going to add and I reached for my sketchbook, I didn't. Um, so I don't know if you all can see that, but this is a circle and there are spokes. So there are eight spokes and I and you can make them anything you want, but mine are work, family, friends, spiritual, exercise, nutrition, volunteer and hobbies. And I put like zero is zero effort or is in the middle. And like a, on a scale of one to 10, 10 would be on the outside. Now you see that work always has a dot, <laughs> but then like family, am I communicating with my family or my friends or my, how's my spiritual oh, is not going too well or exercise nutrition. And I used to do this every single week. And I would look to see what was towards the middle because then I needed to start working on that. So my volunteer had dropped off or whatever it is. So this is my own way of keeping track of, am I keeping a balanced life? Because if work is always at that outside and nothing else is, then that's not a balanced life. So that's just like a little simple thing that I do. And I don't know how old this one is. Usually I date them, but um, anyway, that was in my sketchbook that I just reached for. I love that, Cheryl, it's fantastic. Uh, Diana or Evelyn, I don't know if you had any thoughts on kind of tips or advice that you could share about how individuals can better support their mental health. Right. And I mean, I think we're we're in the middle of the great resignation. Right. I, I literally just saw a, um, an article in Atlantic in the Atlantic last week that actually talked about how it's accelerating. And I am yeah, having switched careers a little bit. You know, I'm constantly getting more inquiries about how I how I did that. Um, so I, architecture firms are have growing amount of work on their plate and they are looking desperately for employees right now and employees are able to kind of affect um, those situations and kind of the firms that they land at and and who they work for so I mean my my um, advice my best advice that I can give right now is to, to be your own best self-advocate and really think about what's important to you. If flexibility is greater to you than, you know, even your, your a, a salary number, kind of make, make that argument for yourself. Um, now's the right time. Evelyn, I think really? your point about advocating for oneself is key. Um, I've done a lot of, uh, presentations where I talk about making a business case for flexibility so that people do feel more empowered to go talk to leaders about why flexibility is a good thing. And, you know, it's like looking at our carbon footprint more carefully and um, letting people work in the hours that are best or they're most productive for them. Or um, the fact that if you commute during the off peak hours, you're going to make, you know, you you get extra time basically in your schedule. So, so you need to think about what's important to you and what you need to communicate and then really prepare sort of your, your spiel, so to, so to speak. Um, you know, anyone at any level can be a change agent in a firm or in, in the organization. Um, it's just about sort of thinking about what's needed and what are the benefits to everyone. Um, 
that's that's one of my uh, answers. But to to Cheryl's point, um, you also have to look in at all the forces in your life and decide which ones you really want to devote time to. Um, I have a high schooler who's with me for two more years, and I'm sort of at, at that point where I'm like, oh, okay, um, this person's not going to be here really soon. Even though she doesn't talk to me right now, what can I do to engage with her, right? Um, and just remember that, uh, you know, this profession has a lot of peaks and valleys, and you can add to that yourself. If you decide you want to slow down for a while, that doesn't mean that you're out forever or you can't come back. We have a couple of mothers in our office who took off four or five years, but they wouldn't, you know, it, they said if they hadn't found us, they probably wouldn't have come back. So you need to also find a context that sort of matches those peaks and valleys that you want to, that you want to sort of force in your life. And um, don't be afraid to do that. You know, you can always go back where you were if you wanted to, maybe not to the same job, but if you try something and it doesn't work, you know, reposition and then move ahead. Completely agree. All very interesting points from, from all, all of you. So thank you so much. Um, I think we've got a few questions coming in from people. And if anyone out there has got any more questions, please do put them in the chat and we'll, we'll put them to our amazing panel. Um, before we go into that, I just had kind of one final question. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are here today thinking you know what can I do to improve mental health uh, kind of for the practice that I work at so in I guess five seconds or less um, what's one thing that you would recommend uh, practices do if they are keen to to better improve mental health um, where, where they work uh, maybe we we'll start with you Diana mm. sorry maybe we don't start here. with you <laughs> don't start with me put well, you on the spot good. there Cheryl have you got one ready to go I think flexibility like allow your staff to be flexible with their hours and ask them what they want and, and acknowledge it. Great. I think that was three things. <laughs> Cut. I was just going to say, just, you know, reinforce and live your firm culture um, because that, that, that will go a long way. Great. I, I would even go to, to say like, um, you know, revisit your firm culture. Like when is when is the test, last time you looked at the, the values and bring your entire staff together to kind of reset those values? A lot, a lot has happened <laughs> in the last two years. You know, um, I, I even talk about how Disney after being in business 50 years finally added inclusion as one of their values. So, if that's something that you're really wanting to live into, then have that conversation. Um, I yeah, and back to what Kirk was saying about ask, just ask your employees what they want. So we, the future forum. I know this is more than fifty seconds. Um, the, the the future forum at, at Slack just did a survey of over ten thousand knowledge workers, and they found a huge gap between the expectations of executives and um, where what what their employees want. So be aware of that gap and see what you can do. Use the culture committee to close that gap rather than plan events um, and be strategic. Thanks, Evan. So I'm gonna go back to flexibility and build on what Cheryl was saying, because that is, that's really the cornerstone of our practice culture. Um, I read somewhere, so this is not my, uh, my sort of adage, but flexibility or flexible means hybrid but hybrid doesn't mean flexible. And I know a lot of firms right now are like, how do we do hybrid? What are we doing? And they aren't, they aren't putting flexibility into the equation. And so, you know, some firm leaders say, well, we're gonna let people come in, uh, or sorry, work from home on Fridays. That's our new hybrid after all we've been through. And um, so actually I'm looking at one of the questions about if it needs to be approved by a manager, absolutely not. It does not need to be approved by a manager. It needs to be embedded in your culture and you as an employee or, or an architect or a leader, you just need to let your team know what's going on and they are going to do the same. So, so I don't, I don't think that flexibility requires approval ever. And I mean, Kirk, everybody you're hiring should be a responsible adult that you trust. Well, place. absolutely. And Kirk, you've, you just said, you know, approval processes in your opinion have a negative impact. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, um, it goes back to your comment, Ben, about trust. Um, 
you know, that's kind of the sacred employer employee relationship element that's most important because when you put things in place that erode trust or at least have the visible impact of that you're not trusting that that just pretty much deteriorates any positive aspects that you may have been trying to accomplish yeah i mean we're only a very small company i've never been a director at a, a big company like some of you guys but i can only assume when people abuse that trust and when they're not completing those tasks, doing the work they need to do, it, it starts to stick out pretty quickly and, and it's very noticeable, so. Right, and, that, and, that, and that's where it becomes a performance discussion, right? You have to trust people are going to do what they need to do to do their jobs, given all the circumstances of teamwork and everything else. And um, you know, that's really what it boils down to. Mm. Absolutely, and yeah, I, I trust trust to me is the, the biggest thing that we can do, giving people that extra trust really. Um, I, I was interested in another question Melinda posed, actually, um, asking whether any of you have ever faced pushback from leadership when you've attempted to incorporate mental health strategies. Um, it's something that I've I've been asked about many times over the years. Um, you know, people, particularly junior staff, are really keen to try and change the workplace culture or bring in a slightly more modern view of, of mental health, perhaps. Or maybe it is increasing trust, increasing transparency. And have been, you know, faced with with kickback, pushback from from management. Is that something any of you have ever faced? And if so, how did you work through that? I, I just put it in. I mean, I, I, right now, I think it's an it's an employee market. So if like if it's just like unconscionable where you are, vote with your feet right? Um, make, make the situation better for yourself. I think I've, I've been there. I've definitely been at the firms where the, the leader had no emotional empathy. And it, you, you just have to, in those cases, there, there are, even though everyone is empowered to be a change agent in your firm, there, there are just some places where that's just not going to happen. And I, I think the ability to acknowledge that and create space um, for yourself, either at that for, firm or, or find the strength to move on, I think is, is, is what people need to do, actually. <laughs> and when you're engaged in that process of, of changing, have those discussions up front. When I moved from Cleveland, to Boston, I interviewed at seven firms and I asked everyone, this was in like 19, or it was 13 years ago, yeah. I asked everyone if all employees could have a VPN connection because VPNs were not like the norm, but that was sort of my benchmark with everyone. So that's what I needed for my mental health. Have the discussions when you're interviewing about like why you're leaving your current firm and what you're looking for and make sure that they understand it's a priority if they're going to hire you. I think that's such a good big bit of advice. And, um, you know, practices will often, or just businesses in general, will be very quick to ask you, you know, um, kind of what are your salary expectations or what are your expectations in terms of work-life balance? But I would always encourage people to flip that back on them and, you know, don't be afraid to ask those sort of questions. You know, how good is your work-life balance at this company and what are your expectations of your staff? Absolutely. Um, another question here that I found really interesting um, from Beth Ruffing um, about uh, kind of saying that actually uh, she seems to think um, architects maybe struggle a little bit when in comparison to say engineers um, looking at sort of managing stresses and things and that much of the office stresses within the architecture industry can often be traced back to sort of the demanding nature of clients or contractors. I'm sure many of you guys have dealt with those issues over the years. Um, do you have any advice on kind of how to mitigate some of those problems, how to reduce the mental health impact that some of those often quite sort of challenging conversations can be? Uh, that they're going to happen. <laughs> and uh, you, need, you need a support structure so that people, because architects, um, generally lean into this stuff because once you get into the industry you know that this stuff's going to be coming at you at any given moment either from a client for, especially you know when you're out in the field with contractors and you know um, Ben you made a comment about kind of the changing dynamics of, of gender in our industry but you know there's still a pretty entrenched you know kind of 
uh, for lack of better terms, old boys network on the construction side of things that, that don't necessarily equate uh, women in architecture the same way that they do men in architecture. And it's, it's, it's been a long time evolving and you, you always hope that we're gonna get there, um, but you know, it, it's still there. And so you have to lean into those things kind of head on and it's part of the training process, right? It's part of, you know, kind of um, situational awareness and, you know, being flexible to deal with these things, which we know are gonna happen in probably different ways. And each, each circumstance gonna be slightly different in how you deal with it based on, you know, the client, the contractor, the people involved. Um, but you have to be flexible enough to understand how best to deal with those. And when it's overwhelming that you have people that you can lean on that can support that, you know, and I, I, I always tell people, ask me what I do as managing partner, you know, I'm the absorber of pretty traditionally all the negative energy that's going to happen, that's going to overcome people because they're going to come to me and let me know. And that's good. And, I, and I'm happy to do it, but there's only so much of that I can also absorb, um, you know, in any given moment, because I'm human, right? Uh, just like everybody else. So we all have to be equipped with the best tools that we can uh, to, to deal with these things that we know are going to always be there um, and, and be flexible enough to understand when we can handle it and when we can't, and when we're overwhelmed and when we're not and when we need some other folks to kind of, to, to, to lean on. Yeah. Evelyn, were you going to say something? Yeah, sorry, my internet literally oh, yeah. just slowed down. I, um, I mean, I do think it's, it's incumbent to us though to kind of be choosy about who we work with, right? Um, and, and the value in our ability to control that conversation also speaks with how we value our own our own fees, right? Um, if you are in a position where you're, you're just you're going in to win the job by lowering your fees, then then like that's you're you're putting yourself in a tight position already. And I and I also think that um, you know in a lot of instances, especially if you're a smaller firm doing high end residential. This is the first time those clients have ever worked with an architect. So then it's also incumbent on us kind of every single meeting that you have with the client to kind of set and manage expectations around the schedule, um, around kind of the process. Um, and, and I know it can be cumbersome to tell these people the same things over and over and over again. But I think if you go in knowing that like you have to start every conversation from that perspective, um, you can you can sometimes manage the more difficult clients that that are trying to micromanage a, an architecture process and get through permitting in one day and all of that good stuff. Thanks very much, guys. All really good answers. I, I think, unfortunately, we're coming to the end of our time, really. Um, it's absolutely rattled by and I've really loved hearing from all of you. Um, again, just like to reiterate thanks to, to Emily and AIA Ohio for putting together such an interesting panel of genuinely fascinating people. I could continue this conversation. Um, well, it's, it's evening here, but yeah, all night. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much again. And thank you for having me too. Um, I'll pass you back over to Emily now. Great, thank you, Ben. And thank you to our panelists. Um, I think I speak for the group when I say this was really great, um, sort of a breath of fresh air to hear all of your different perspectives and to bring the idea of mental health into our practices. Um, thank you so much for giving your time, sharing your experiences with us. Um, for those of you who are here for learning units, make sure you check the chat box for um, the link to register for those. And again, I just wanna thank everyone for being here today. And um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, thank everybody. You. <laughs> Where did Kate go? <laughs> I can't end the meeting. <laughs>